yeah, so Rebecca asked me to do like a little presentation on, um, I guess permaculture is the general topic we're under, but we're looking specifically at building a type of bed called a hugel culture bed and planting uh, a plant community into it called a plant guild. So um, we built this bed last year. We did kind of a similar um, presentation last year in two days. One day we built the bed and then the other day we planted it. So um, I'll just talk a little bit about the hugel culture method first. So the problem here in this particular area is there's not uh, there's not good soil. It's like uh, sand everywhere. <laughs> so and that's a problem for a lot of people in Belmont, unless if you're kind of in a you know farmland area. But those places are few and far between. So. Um, this is a method that kind of allows you to build topsoil, um, you know, good garden soil, just using debris that you might have around your garden. So we started with, um, we didn't have to strip any grass or sod or topsoil because we were just working on sand, but that would be the first step would be if you have topsoil or sod, pull it up, but we didn't need to do that. So um the next step is you pile up like woody debris so um, it can be like logs like large logs um you know half rotten firewood um wood scraps from around your yard and you just pile that all up in a big pile um, and that's kind of the base of the bed and then on top of that you're going to pile smaller and smaller things so um you know tree clippings like little branch clippings or rose bush clippings could go next um, wood chip if you have any of that around um, we used we had some wood chip and we also had some uh, spent mushroom sawdust as well that was used for growing mushrooms prior so that's really good or half half rotten wood is good because it already has fungi in it and that will help aid the decomposition of the wood um, so we put that, we put, um, I think we had some like straw and um, grass clippings and then on top of that we piled topsoil and composted manure and then that's your bed. So you water it heavily when you first make it to kind of get that decomposition going and then the benefit of using a bed like that aside from building topsoil is that it also um, as it decomposes um, really slowly, it releases just a little bit of heat. So you'll get kind of an extension on your um, gardening season. So it'll be a little bit warmer earlier in the season and it'll stay a little bit warmer, you know, later in the season. Um, it also retains moisture really well, especially if you water it really well when you first start. Um, so you shouldn't have the same kind of watering requirements as you'd have in a normal garden bed. Um, and it also gives you like a larger surface area to work from too. So with the mounded structure, um, you know, some, some people even recommend building it up quite high so that you can harvest kind of from the top down. Um, so it's kind of got the benefit of a raised bed like that. Um, yeah, and then it'll decompose over time and it'll shrink probably about two thirds. So by the time it's all decomposed, you know, it's, it's kind of shrunk by about maybe a third, not quite from what it was last year. And it'll shrink again, probably another third. Um, but then you can just continue to use it just as a garden bed indefinitely. Um, yeah, so that's the Hugo culture method of, of kind of building soil. Do you guys have any questions about that method or? Um, every year do you continue putting um, topsoil on top or it's done? Um, you don't have to, but I mean like any, any garden bed, you wanna have inputs if you're taking things out of it. So it won't have kind of the same demands as like if you have a tilled garden soil, you, you have to add to it quite a bit every year. This will continue to release nutrients over a much longer period. So you shouldn't need to add to it every year, but I'd still recommend um, kind of mulching with a bit of compost every year, just, just to kind of like 
enhance the fertility constantly. And then, you know, then if you're doing that, just a little bit of addition every year, um, you shouldn't need to do as much as like you would need to do in like a tilled garden. Yeah, so if you, if you have it, put it on. <laughs> um, another way that you can really like um, contribute to the soil fertility is by just mulching with straw and grass clippings throughout the growing season. And that will also retain moisture. Um, it will keep the weeds kind of at bay. It'll suppress the weeds. And over time, you know, earthworms will come eat those grass clippings and straw and it'll become part of the soil. So um, that's another way of kind of uh, enhancing your soil fertility. Um, and also you're suppressing weeds and um, reducing the amount of watering you have to do too. So, yeah, any other one, other questions? No? <laughs> okay, um, so today what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually plant into this bed. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna plant a community of plants. So um, with permaculture, kind of one of the uh, kind of tenets of permaculture, or one of the kind of uh, ideas behind it is that you're mimicking nature. You're, you're doing kind of what nature does um, to provide uh, a kind of a more sustainable and regenerative um, garden or, or farm. So um, in nature, we have you know, if you look in the forest, the ground is totally covered and um, there's a variety of plants growing and each kind of fills a different niche um, and occupies kind of a different part of the landscape. So we're kind of mimicking that and we're going to use the same idea when we're planting a garden. So um, what, what we're, I'm kind of using as the base model for this is the Three Sisters Guild. So this is a, a really old plant guild that many of the First Nations um, cultures across North America, especially in the southern parts um, of, of North America, uh, or I should say the Americas, used. Um, and that's the corn, squash, and beans. So it's these three plants that they would always plant together, usually in mounds. Um, and so uh, the corn, it grows up and tall and um, it provides uh, basically a climbing structure for the beans. The beans um, fix nitrogen in the soil so they're a legume and they have the ability to take nitrogen from the air um, and bring it into the soil. So they feed, help feed the corn which requires actually quite a lot of nutrients to be productive. So the bean feeds the corn, it climbs up the corn and it also feeds the squash, which you plant with it as well. And the squash spreads out over the bottom and it provides like a ground cover and it protects the soil from drying out. Um, and so it reduces kind of the watering requirement for the other plants too. So they all kind of occupy a different space and they have different nutrient needs. And so they, they grow really well together. So we're gonna plant those in here. Um, but we're also going to add to it a little bit too. So we have to do some modifications because of our climate. So the squash, I pick, I have a, this is a um, green Hubbard. It's like a pumpkin type, but it's already been started because our growing season is quite short. Um, and then I have another type of squash too, which we'll direct seed. Um, let's see, what is it called? So this is called Carnival Hybrid. It's a winter squash, but it's a short season squash. So it, it's 85 days instead of like 100, 120 days that a lot of squash need. So um, choosing plant varieties that'll work for our climate. Um, and then we have um, corn as well. So the corn is a sweet corn. It's a 73 day corn. So again, like a shorter growing season variety compared with what you might see in other parts of the world. Um, and then we're gonna plant both peas and beans. So peas do the same thing as beans. They fix nitrogen in the soil, they climb, um, but they tend to be a bit more adapted to colder uh, growing conditions. So we're gonna plant uh, 
peas, climbing peas, and I'm actually going to use bush beans this year because it's already June. <laughs> And um, again, it's like a shorter growing season. So they'll still fix nitrogen in the soil, but they won't climb up. So the, the peas will be our kind of our climbing plant. Um, some other plants that you can put in there or that we are gonna put in there. So um, as, as a similar to corn or as a substitution for corn, you can always use sunflowers too. So we're gonna plant sunflowers as well. Um, I mean, you can eat, you can harvest the seeds and eat them, or you can just plant them as an ornamental and a, and a bird and pollinator um, species. So um, it's good always to plant a few flowers in there that will help to draw in insects um, to help with pollination. And, uh, and they're just beautiful too. So, <laughs> um, and then I have another, uh, variety of um, this is a green it's called red orac um, and it's some people call it red spinach or uh, red uh, lamb's quarters it looks kind of similar to lamb's quarters but it grows really tall so um, the mature plant can basically provide a climbing structure for peas um, and it's drought tolerant but it also kind of lasts long into the into the season like it's it's well adapted for our climate um, and you can eat the leaves like you'd eat spinach so it's kind of a nice filler um, and what else do I have I have lupins as well so um, lupins are a perennial uh, flower but um, so they're not edible actually the seeds are poisonous but um, it's really good for bringing in pollinators and it's a nitrogen fixing plant too. So it will also um, basically like feed the soil over time. So um, those are a nice one to include in your garden. And I also have some kale and some uh, violets, which are just like early season plants. They provide a bit of ground cover and food earlier in the season and also later in the season too. So. The violets are, these are Johnny Jump Ups. They're edible. You can eat the flowers. If you want to garnish your salads with them, you can. Um, and then the, the kale too will be um, kind of really good after a frost. So after everything else dies back, you'll still have something growing that you can harvest. So that's what we're going to plant in here today. Um, do we have any questions about the plants or? um yeah so i would not put um alums or like i wouldn't put onions or garlic because they tend to suppress the growth of the legumes so the peas and beans don't do well with the the garlic and the onion so those ones i wouldn't um those are that's the only one i can think of off the top of my head but you can also like consult a companion planting chart and just see like, does anything not get along well together and, and don't choose those varieties. Yeah. I, I'm wondering about the lupins. Will they just start spreading everywhere after a bit and take over? Um, they're not, like they, they do self seed and spread, but they're not invasive like that. So, um, I mean, I have them in my garden. I do get volunteers popping up in my garden here and there, but um, they're not weedy. They don't really take over, so. Yeah. yeah. We have them on the edge of our hill. Okay. And then Brian, when he, if he wants to mow after, they're like, they're really hard and tough to mow. The bees love them. Yeah. Um, and so we've left them a small area, but they seem to have been spreading out. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess it might depend a bit on the, like the soil and the other plants, because there is a lot of bare soil here you might see them popping up in where, you know, wherever there's a gap in the soil, that's kind of an opportunity for weeds. So um, that's kind of one aspect of why, why they might spread. But um, I mean, I've never really heard them being kind of complained about as being invasive, I guess, cause they're beautiful too, right? Like people, people tend to love them. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm not too worried about that. Okay. 
They're, they're also a bi, well, sorry, no, they're not a biennial, they're a perennial, but they don't flower until the second year. So we're planting a volunteer seedling that came up in my garden this spring, but it won't bloom this year, it'll bloom next year. Yeah, so it takes them a while to get established, but then they, they continue to bloom every year after that. Yeah. Any other questions before we start? Okay, well, we'll just uh, dig in there. We'll just get started planting. Um, there's not really like a particular method for where things need to go. Usually I plant the squash at the top so that they can like trail down. But um, I have seeds, so we'll plant, you know, some squash along the top and then kind of work down along the sides. Um, and then uh, just kind of maybe every foot or so plant a corn in a pea or a bean plant. Um, and then it'll just kind of fill in over the summer. Yeah, so we can jump in. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 